Joining us now on the line from San Francisco, California, Andrew McAfee, co-author of Race Against the Machine and principal research scientist at the Center for Digital Business in the MIT Sloan School of Management. Andrew, it's good to have you on the line from California. I wanted to let you know, coincidentally, that if you looked, oh, I don't know, 500 miles south of you today at the LA Times, there's a feature editorial in which the headline is, When Droids Take Your Job. Does that basically sum up what you've been trying to tell us? Yes and no. Um, in the book Race Against the Machine, Eric Brynjolfsson, who's my co-author and I, decided to write that book because we noticed basically that the average worker was being left behind by cutting edge technology. And we noticed that when we looked in two different places. First of all, when we looked at some of the, the really astonishing recent advances in technology, and by that I mean things like a car that can drive itself in traffic and a supercomputer that can beat the best human Jeopardy players and a, a piece of software that you carry around on your mobile phone that can understand what you're saying and reply back to you in pretty good human speech, these are fairly astonishing technical advances and you don't have to work your imagination too hard before you realize that they can substitute for a lot of what we employ people to do right now. So we looked at some of the technical advances and we just were blown away by them because they're, to us, they were fairly unexpected, they're quite recent, and they're really significant. And the other place we looked was in the economic data. And it is becoming pretty clear that our society is, is becoming more unequal, that the gaps between the high earners and the low earners, or the wealthy and the poor, are getting bigger over time. It's be pretty clear that our recovery out of this terrible recession is largely a jobless recovery, and there's a lot of different kinds of economic evidence that, again, that we're becoming a little bit more unequal and that the average worker is having a harder and harder time these days. We don't think these two things are unrelated, and we think this technical progress is one of the driving forces that we're seeing behind some of the employment, some of the workforce statistics. But the reason I say no in answer to your question is that it's not the case that next week we're all going to be unemployed or made unemployed by computers or made redundant. The robots are not about to take over everything that we can do right now. And there's going to be a lot of opportunity ahead for the people with the right skills and the, the right bundle of abilities. And then the last point I want to make is in response to something uh, you said at the, at the introduction, which is beware of the machines. I want to be super clear. We don't want to beware of the machines in most senses. The, the technologies that we have these days are amazing. They are improving our lives. They're improving our ability to produce and consume. And they're overall a great thing for our society and for the economy. We wrote the book because we were, we were concerned that we weren't paying enough attention to their impact on the workforce and on our, our employee base. Okay, lots to unpack there, which we'll do over the course of the hour tonight. But under the category of everything old is new again, I wanted to share with you and our viewers a quote that you put in your book, and here it comes. We are being effect afflicted with a new disease of which some readers may not yet have heard the name, but of which they will hear a great deal in the years to come, namely technological unemployment. This means unemployment due to our discovery of means of economizing the use of labor, outrunning the pace at which we can find new uses for labor. Now that was written by an economist named Keynes in the 1930s. And the question is, um, why did you feel it was important to say something that had been said 81 years ago today? Yeah, because this was one of the very few cases where Keynes was not correct, at least in the short to medium term. So the advanced economies of the world did not see technological unemployment in the years after the 30s and the decades after Keynes wrote that. So the really critical question is what, if anything, is different now? And th the best answer I can give to that, and the reason that we wrote this book, is because we think things actually are different now. The pace of technological progression is faster than it used to be, so things are happening much more quickly. The displacement is happening more quickly. The second thing is that the displacement is not just affecting one job category or one industry. So the Industrial Revolution was a huge important deal if you ran a factory. If you ran an accounting firm, for example, the, the advent of steam or electric power didn't change things that much for you. The advent and the speed of these digital technologies is affecting just about everybody. And the third reason that we think things are different now is that if you look at the basically the entire previous history of technology, 
technological advancement, it, all those advances did not encroach very much on all the skills that a person had. So the Industrial Revolution encroached on our muscle power, and you don't hire people anymore because of their ability to lift heavy stuff, unless you're looking for a circus strongman. The computer age so far has impacted the human skills of following routine instructions and doing arithmetic, basically. So again, not that huge an encroachment into the stuff that you might hire a person for. When we looked at what computers have recently demonstrated their ability to do, we see a lot more encroachment in the bundle of skills that you might hire a person for. So we see computers recently displaying great communication ability, where they've previously been pretty lousy. We see computers demonstrating really advanced pattern recognition abilities. Again, historically, they've been pretty lousy at that. So we see these recent big advances into skills that previously belonged to human beings alone. That means the list of things you might want to hire a human being to do is shrinking instead of growing. Okay, what's and that's on that why list, we then? think things really are different now. Help, help us out with that last part. What's on that list now? A few of the things. You can't make sure, an so, exhaustive list, but start us out. Yep. So absolutely, we, I, we haven't seen computers demonstrate anything that I would call creative ability. So if you look at a computer's ability to write a decent report, let alone a poem or a short story or a novel, they're still laughably bad at that. Computers are great at solving problems in the domain they've been programmed for, but really lousy at expanding that domain by themselves. So for example, IBM built a computer that became the world's best chess player in the late 1990s. Then the team of human beings at IBM said, okay, we're going to take what we've learned and apply it to a very, very different challenge, namely playing Jeopardy, the computer had no ability to say, I want to go play Jeopardy next. Mm -hmm. So problem solving and being able to frame and then attack a problem, computers really haven't demonstrated an ability to do that yet. And it's still true that for both communication and pattern recognition, human beings are holding the high ground right now. Now, I expect to see a lot of encroachment there, but, there, but still, human beings are better at these things than computers are right now. In the physical world, I don't think restaurant busboys, for example, are in any danger of being displaced because our robots are still fairly lousy at walking around around a room, picking up a plate, displaying any combination of coordination and fine motor skills and locomotion, computers are still lousy at these things. So again, when we look around, we don't see everyone in the workforce under threat of displacement mm -hmm. in the immediate term. I will pick up on your, your uh, reference a second ago to the chessboard, though, because I think you do use that metaphor of a chessboard in your book to explain where we're sort of at right now. Can you explain that? Yeah, because we, um, we noticed that these advances had moved from the stuff of science fiction into business reality with, with just weird, breathtaking speed. It, it, computers were terrible at playing game shows, let alone a really difficult game show like Jeopardy. Uh, we, we relied on a book that was written in 2004 by some colleagues of ours, really well-trained economists, trying to understand what computers were good at versus people. The example they gave of what people were good at that computers were not going to be able to match was driving a car in traffic. Six years later, in 2010, Google had demonstrated an ability to do that. So this, the pace of, of advancement was weird to us at first until we came upon a, a um, kind of a metaphor that really helped us understand what might be going on. And as you say, it's a story about, it's a legend about the inventor of the game of chess who took his invention to the emperor of India, showed him the game of chess, and the emperor was so delighted by the invention that he said, wow, you can name your own reward. The inventor was a really clever guy, and he said, Your Majesty, all I want is a pile of rice. And we're going to calculate the pile of the size of the pile of rice by putting one grain of rice on the first square of my chessboard. We're going to double that. We're going to put two grains of rice on the second square of the chessboard. Double that, double that. Now, the inventor obviously knew a bit more math than the emperor did because the emperor thought that the, he was asking for two smaller rewards. So he granted it just in an offhand way. And then if you do these doublings, if you do 63 of these doublings, you wind up with a pile of rice that's the size of Mount Everest. <laughs> so in some versions of the legend, the emperor, once he realizes that he's been had, he beheads the inventor because he's so upset at being fooled. The point of telling the story, though, is not just to demonstrate the power of constant doubling. 
And we know that computers double in power and capability about every 18 months. That's Moore's law. It's, it's held true basically for the entire computer age. The reason to tell that story where we thought things got really interesting was in the second half of the chessboard. Because Ray Kurzweil, who's an inventor and a futurist, makes a really interesting observation. He says, after 32 doublings, after the, in the first half of the chessboard, once you're halfway through, you only have a pile of rice that's the equivalent of about what you'd get out of one big field. In other words, the emperor is not in danger of, of losing his entire kingdom worth of riches, and the inventor is not in danger of losing his head. It's only when you get into the second half of the chessboard that this constant doubling really starts to overwhelm all of your intuition, all of your preconceptions, and starts to yield piles of rice the size of Mount Everest. So we thought that was really interesting. We did a quick back of the envelope calculation. The United States started tracking something called information technology as an investment category in 1958. If you take 18 months as that doubling period, and that's, that's the most common one with Moore's Law, you add 32 times 18 months to that, that takes you up to about 2006. So by that really trivial calculation, we entered the second half of the chessboard when it comes to computers somewhere around the middle of the last decade. And that helps explain to me why we see things like the Jeopardy playing supercomputer and Siri and the Google car and all these weird science fiction kinds of technologies appearing just in the past few years. Now, if that example has any, if that story has any validity to it, there is one conclusion, and that is we ain't seen nothing yet hmm. because the doubling is going to continue and the accumulation of technological prowess and knowledge and capability is only going to continue. So we're going to keep getting blown away away by the digital advances in, of the future. Andrew, let me sneak in one more question before we broaden our discussion, and I, I ask the other guests to join us as well. I, is it not conventional wisdom in our society that we expect that whatever jobs we lose because of new technology, they're going to be replaced by new jobs, and is that true? It yeah, that has been conventional wisdom, and it has been remarkably true for at least the past 200 years. The Luddites started smashing looms in, in England just about 200 years ago because they were afraid for their jobs, and they did lose their jobs, but they found other jobs. And the entire history of technical progress has been one of creative destruction. Technology destroys some kinds of jobs and some kinds of job categories, but it creates entirely new ones. That's still going on. The important thing to keep in mind is that there is no economic law that says that those two always have to be in balance and that the pace of, of creation has to match the pace of destruction. That's, that's not written anywhere. So the, the main thing that I'm concerned about now is that we are, we are destroying our, the destruction side of that equation is, a, is more pronounced than the creation side. Both are absolutely still going on. And I sit here in San Francisco, kind of in the epicenter of the technology revolution. There's a huge amount of creation going on, new companies, new jobs being formed. But these industries are not making a huge dent in the big base of unemployment that we have. I'll give you one quick statistics. Um, Apple, Amazon, Facebook, and Google combined are extraordinarily valuable, influential, really, really powerful companies. They combine to employ fewer than 125,000 people. That is less than the number of people who enter the American workforce every month. Hmm. Okay, that's Andrew McAfee, co-author of Race Against the Machines.